Gary Chapman's work. Yeah, it's, it's sim similar to that, but this is just in the sensory area. All right. Well, Dr. Taylor has graciously offered some of her materials for, um, for distribution, for giving away. And um, so who, who here is, uh, let's see, who's, who's the oldest person here? Who will admit to being the oldest person here? <coughs> so if anyone who's over 80, all right, 85, 87, all right, well, it would be my mom, but she's indisposed right now, what? 87, 88, 90, going once, going twice, all right. All right, Betty, right? Which would you like? There's, a, there's one for kids, there's one for parents, and there's one for... Okay, all right. All right. <clears throat> um, all right. I didn't want to. I don't want to. I, want, I didn't want to bring a question from last night because if you weren't here last night, you'd be penalized for not being here last night. But that's the way it is. Huh? <laughs> we will just give a preference for those who are here. Oh man, I had so many of those things written down last night. Now I can't remember any of them. But yeah, okay. Um, who has who has a birthday coming up? Just I mean the closest birthday. I hope you all have birthdays coming up. What? Monday? We have two with Mondays. All right, we have two for Monday. All right. All right, you, have, you both are in, on Monday? What time were you born? <laughs> you have no idea, okay. 4.30, what, p.m.? P.m. She has no idea. Okay, you get first. All right. All right, I'm going to grab which one you like. This one looks more adventure. Oh, that one looks very adventuresome for your grandkids. But that one, yeah. Okay, and our last one, and we will be having more to give away after the last session, so if you haven't gotten one yet, <coughs> uh, let's see. All right. So uh, who can tell me what percent of the population are kinesthetic learner, uh, sensory preferences? Who said that? All right, here you go. You're right, 20%. Okay, without further ado, time is yours. See, I have him do that because I can't come up with anything. I mean, the kind of questions I would like to ask, you wouldn't want to answer in public. <laughs> so it's better that I just let him do it. <laughs> okay, let's go. Top left. Think in the box. Think out of the box. Think twice. Double think. Second on the left. Court is in session. Third on the left. Love what? What shape is this? L. What is L? Yes, love letter. Good job. Fourth on the left. I'll be seeing you. I know that was too easy. Top right. Lace underwear. Good. It's usually a man who gets that. And uh, they're not always willing to say it, but all of you got it. Second on the right. All right, there's two different diametrically opposed answers right off the bat. You are crazy. It's crazy all around you. And either one are valid, but it's a difference in brain function. Third on the right. Yes, good job, lost at sea. 
That's often a really hard one for people, but man, some brain got it right off the bat. Fourth on the right. Ahead of the game. There you go. Are, are your brains getting more comfortable doing these? Good. All right. What kind of bird do you see? All right. Here we have another difference. Some people say goose, Canada goose. Some people say dove, pigeon. It will usually depend on which eye is your lead eye. So your lead eye always tends to look at the opposite side of something. So if you have a right lead eye, then you probably saw the goose first. But if you have a left lead eye, you probably saw the pigeon or the dove first. Because it's just automatic. Your eyes just go to the edge. Now, I turned it around. What do you see first? Does it make a little bit of a difference? It will for some people. For people who have their energy advantage in the frontal right, where there's no language, just pictures, uh, sometimes they see it almost at the same time. So here they go, filled in. Does it make it easier or more difficult for you to see them? Who likes it filled in? Who likes the outline? Almost 50-50. And it's not right or wrong, good or bad, it's different. So if you were having to make a decision based on whether something was outlined or filled in, do you got a 50-50 split here. So now you would have to be able to negotiate because it's diametrically opposed. All right. I just finished in Central California conference a weekend seminar for couples on gender differences. We had so much fun. So I want to do one section for you. We did seven sections during the weekend. So I mentioned every brain is different, although we're more alike than we are different, and that stands for male brains and female brains as well. But I want to talk about four specific ways in which research has shown that we are very different. First, in the number of P and M cells in the retina, color perception, vision style, and how we listen. So let's start with P cells in the retina, back here in the occipital lobes. The female brain has many, many more P cells, P for perception. Ah, the male brain has some P cells, but not a lot. And that can differ uh, definitely by the male. The P cell in the female brain is designed to process color and texture. And the colors that the female P cells are most sensitive to are red, orange, green, and beige. Male brains, with their pathetic little P cells, their brains are more sensitive to black, gray, silver, and blue. So when you look at the way males tend to dress themselves, you know, this is bell curve research, most of them are going to be gravitating toward one of those colors, unless their wives dress them. And when you look at high-end cars and their colors, what are they usually colored? Usually one of these variations. I saw once a green Rolls Royce in Paris, but it was so dark it almost looked black. Now the female brain has not very many M cells. They're pathetic. And the male brain has tons of them. In fact, the male fetus moves more during pregnancy than the female fetus. And women who've had multiple children, my grandmother was one of 13, she said her mother knew exactly what she was carrying, male or female, by how active it was. They're designed to detect, emotion, to detect motion, M for motion. So in general, Physically, females are not 
quite as active as males. Now remember, this is bell curve research, so we're talking about two-thirds of the population. There's some women who are more active than some men, but in general, males are more active. And the female brain is pre-wired to be more interested in faces. Male brain, pre-wired to be interested in things that move and are more physically active. Now, we are a combination of nature and nurture. Nature, genes and chromosomes. Nurture is epigenetics, cellular memory, what happens in the environment. So if researchers can test babies really, really early, they get more of a sense whether this is innate. Because by the age of one, 12 months, you can't really tell that this is pretty much nature and this is pretty much nurture. Everything's kind of blended. So here's an example of one research project. So imagine that there's 50 bassinets across the floor here. 25 girls, 25 boys. The babies are three days old. There's a graduate student at each bassinet and other graduate students watching everything that happens. So the first thing they do is they have a large picture of a real human face and they hold it over the bassinet. And now they watch what the babies do. And the little girl babies look at the face, and they look at the face, and they look at the face, and they'll stay looking at the face almost as long as you hold it up there. And the little boys look at the face. They ain't moving. They look away, and many of them will never look back. They looked at it once. All right, so here's the takeaway. Stop telling little boys to look at you. They looked at you once. <laughs> they don't want to look at you again. And I hear parents and teachers over and over and over again saying, look at me when I'm talking to you. They don't want to look at you while they're talking to you. But little girls in adulthood, you know, if Betsy and I were talking to each other, we'd be looking right directly at each other, and we could just keep looking at each other for 30 minutes while we talked. You never see men do that, never. One man is looking this way, jingling change in his pocket. The other guy is looking this way, and occasionally they'll glance at each other, but they're talking and they're not even looking at each other. So pay attention to that and stop telling little boys to look at you. The only research in adulthood that we find that I think is funny is that males will stare at a female if she is in a tight, bright red dress and she's got a really good figure. <laughs> Otherwise, statistically, they're just glancing and they're just not focusing, you know, the way females tend to do. All right, now they have the same 50 babies and they have a mobile, you know, that when you move it, little dangly things move. All right, so now they got a mobile over each bassinet and they watch to see what happens. And the little girls look at the mobile. Hmm, no faces. Look away. And they may never look back at the mobile. Little boys look at the mobile. Hallelujah, something's moving. And they will stare at the mobile almost as long as you keep it moving. So it's a very different process. So what's the takeaway? Well, boys learn better when they're moving. In fact, I told you last night in large sample studies, 50% of all the kids tested learn best when they're standing and moving. So if you teach and I could orchestrate the classroom, I would have at least one half of the desks be standing level. And I would let the kids sit for a while, stand for a while, and more of the boys would probably end up standing, although some of the girls would also do better when they're standing but we don't know the research and we don't apply it. Now, vision style. This has nothing to do with whether you have 20-20 vision. It has to do with the style of vision. And basically, males have a long-range, narrow, tunnel vision style. And it's, there's that built-in set of binoculars we were talking about last night. It takes 1.6 years long 
longer for the male brain to mature. And part of that, we think, is takes a while to build a set of binoculars. But in large sample studies, males see further into the distance than women do. I was lecturing at a university back in, I don't know, Missouri. They were talking about the hunter-gatherer societies. And they said, oh, do you suppose that has to do with the hunter-gatherer societies? We thought, we always thought that was evolutionary. And I said, well, you know, if you are depending on throwing a spear or a bow and arrow at something to get your dinner, best you be able to see it a long way off. And by the time the female could see it and get a shot off, she probably would have scared it away. So the males would do better in that sense. On the other hand, females have a shorter but much wider range of vision. And so then you talk about the gatherers, they can look down and actually see something at their feet to pick up. Uh, if males had to do that, they'd probably starve because it's the wrong distance for them. I saw this as a school nurse, you know, these poor little boys who are dying to move. And, and I went to school, of course, when we still had chalk boards. So the teacher would say, I need a new package of chalk. And every little boy in the room had his hand up to go get the box of chalk. And he'd, she'd pick one, and he'd run over, and he'd open the cupboard and look, and look, <laughs> and look. And some little girl would hop up, run over, off viciously, and say, what's the matter, you blind? It's right here. <laughs> fine range for her, but not a fine range for him. And we need to understand that. This is what we find in many homes. So in our house, if we could even open the fridge door and it would stay open, that would be one thing, but it, w it won't. It's got this automatic closer to save electricity or whatever. And if it would stay open and you could back up and give him eight or ten feet, he could see everything, but he can't see holding the door open. And I think this is one reason men don't live as long as women. Because that must be very frustrating and very stressful. <laughs> so I didn't know this research when I was raising my three stepsons. I met their father when they were one, two, and three, and we got married when they were three, four, and five. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I tell people, I'm just telling you what I did. I'm not recommending it. <laughs> Love them to pieces, but let me tell you, that was a shock. And as an auditory, I learned that I would rather have their, their friends at our house so I could sort of monitor what was going on. And I learned quickly that I only had to check in one of, you know, a couple of instances. If I heard no sound at all, I would go check. And if I heard a ruckus, I'd go check. They went through a period of time when they loved I can't remember the name. It was a kind of lemonade that came in a little shallow tin container and you pulled off the, the top and dumped it into two quarts of water and you had two quarts of lemonade. They loved that. So I would make three pitchers of lemonade so they'd have plenty of lemonade and put it in the fridge. And it would go like this. Mom, we're thirsty. Fine, help yourself. Lots of lemonade in the fridge. Pause. Where in the fridge? <laughs> On the top shelf. Pause. Where on the top shelf? About that time, I would get up and go into the kitchen, and I have to tell you honestly that I'm sure sometimes my voice took on a little edge, as I said. It's right there on the top shelf. Do you see those three pictures? They're bright red. What colors register fastest in the male brain? 
Is red one of them? No, not unless it's on a curvy female or on a, you know, a fancy sports car. I picked a color that registered quickly in my brain, and here they're looking and they can't see it, and then they'd say, oh, thanks, Mom, sorry, and I now feel terrible. When I get a new piece of information, you know, it's really helpful to call them up and say, can you come over for dinner Thursday night? Okay, and over time, that means, oh, what are you going to apologize for? <laughs> Wait till you get here. And they'll come over and I'll say, you know, I really want to apologize for sounding pretty impatient when you couldn't see the pictures of lemonade. I said, I had no idea that I was making it work for me, but not for you. Oh, it's okay, Mom, just fix our favorite food, it's fine. I mean, they're very gracious. But that's, that was a problem. So here's the deal. If you've got one refrigerator and there are males and females in the house, you better give all the males one shelf of their own <laughs> and stop touching it. I can't tell you the number of men who've said, you know, the most stressful day of our lives every year is the Super Bowl because we have our cans of 7-Up or whatever. And we go to the fridge and we put them where exactly we will know to find them. We don't even have to see them. Half time, we run to the fridge, we grab our can. Ooh, it's a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> Some officious female has moved their can because it didn't belong there. So better yet is their own fridge. But... You know, a shelf is, is good, but then you have to promise to leave stuff alone, women. And I told them there's only two times that I will touch something on that shelf, promise. If I open the door and something's moving on that shelf, I'll check it out. If I open the door and there's this great big, you know, fur ball, I'll check it out too. But otherwise, it's your shelf, put stuff where you want it because that must be very stressful for men. And they live on the average, you know, six or seven years less than females. So you women have a choice. You know, help them live a stress-free life so they live longer. Or on the other hand, <laughs> okay. Hearing acuity, this is just amazing. Uh, men are born with less acute hearing to start with. I hate to tell you that, gentlemen, but that's the way it is. You just don't hear. And women have much more acute hearing, which means also that they're much more easily distracted by sounds in the environment. Men are not so distracted. In fact, if something's going on in the environment, it often just helps their brain to focus even more. And we learned this from IQ tests. You have a room full of males and females taking a, a timed IQ test, and everything is just absolutely quiet in the room. Who will make higher scores, males or females? Females. They're re-roofing the building you know, and they're vacuuming next in the room next door, who's going to make higher scores, males or females? Males. So even something as simple as an IQ test score can change based on whether it's a male brain or a female brain and what's going on in the environment. Men have a higher incidence of word deafness. Now looking back, it was funny but it wasn't so funny growing up because my father would hear a word and think it was something very similar, but not the word. So, you know, it would be a clam and ham or something like that. And he'd say, did you say ham, Kathleen? No, I didn't. I said clam. Because a little bit more word deafness than females have. The earliest study I can find is this one. As early as age 11, girls tend to be distracted by noise levels 10 times softer than anything that a comparable male will find distracting. And that's huge. The hearing differences, 
you know, I told you that males start out with poor hearing to begin with, and it just goes downhill from there. And many, many more males need assistive hearing devices as they get older. So if you need one, wear one, because that's the male condition. And women need to understand how differently males and females hear spoken words. Uh, first of all, practical application. If you've got all women, then you want to keep the environment really free of distracting sounds, not music in the background, nothing like that, and they will do better. Uh, sometimes they'll even do better doing something with their hands, taking notes, knitting, something like that. Men focus better with music in the background. You know, if I didn't have a female brain, we'd have music playing, and you guys would focus better, actually because the music would be a distraction in the environment for you. But if you want me to string two words together, we can't have music playing, because I can either listen or I can talk. Men often need to be doing something with their hands to stay awake or standing up and get moving around. When I finally got this information, I was going to do a presentation to 250 psychiatrists for an annual convention, and they were all males in this particular group. I told you that sometimes I think things and had no intention to say them. So I arrive with this huge box of little squeezy brains. And so I had helpers, and as I stood up to speak, I said, gentlemen, I've brought each of you a brain. <laughs> they were not amused. <laughs> So we're passing out these little squeezy brains, and I told them, if you at all begin to find your mind floating off someplace else or get sleepy, either get up or start squeezing your brain, and it will work. And males who do that even sometimes manage to sit through entire sermons without sleeping. Now, the hearing differences are what are, is just amazing to me. So if you can see this, remember there's those four chunks of tissue again, the two uh, occipital lobes for vision, there's the two temporal lobes. The temporal lobe on the left side has an increased advantage for decoding speech sounds, again about an 85% advantage, and the other 15% is non-speech sounds. The bark of a dog, the whistle of a train, the cry of a baby. And the right side, it just flips. It's got an 85% advantage for non-speech sounds and a 15% advantage for speech sounds. So if you lose one side, you know, you can pick up most on the other, although it might be a little more difficult. So they put a female brain in a PET scan camera, and they ask her to listen to a whole range of human voices, old, young, male, female, and it doesn't matter both temporal lobes will light up. So she's decoding speech sounds, and she's getting the music of speech, if you will, the voice inflections that many boys and men completely miss. All right, now you put a male brain in a PET scan camera, ask him to listen to a male voice, and what do you suppose happens? The left temporal lobe lights up where you decode speech sounds, and he hears the male just fine. You ask him to listen to a female voice, and it flips. Nothing turns on on the left side. It's dark pitch night. What does light up is the right hemisphere where you decode a melody line of music. So if a man likes the sound of the voice of his wife and, or girlfriend and little girls, he's perfectly happy to have them chatter on because it's a distraction in the environment. And he's listening with his right hemisphere that has a very small uh, percentage for decoding speech sounds. So he has no idea what she's saying. But he's enjoying listening. So at breakfast, when he's reading the paper, that's a distraction, or the radio or TV on with the news, 
and she's chattering away. He's perfectly happy to have her chatter away. He focuses in more easily on the TV or the paper, and everything is fine. She says, are you listening to me, Harry? He goes, uh-huh. He is. And then she makes the mistake of saying, what did I just say? He has not a clue. And he'll say something that she said three weeks ago, and then there's hell to pay. So it's really helpful to understand that. So I told, I was talking about this at a seminar once, and the lady came up to me and she said, well, I have two problems. And I said, uh, okay, what are they? Well, she says, the first problem is that my husband is always asking me to find things for him. She said, I'll be working around the house and I'll hear, hun, and I know he's lost something. And I'll say, yes, dear. And he'll say, have you seen my glasses? And she'll say, are they on your head? No? Well, let's see. I think I saw them last on your desk. Pause. Where on my desk? Right in the middle of your desk. Pause. Will you help me find them? She said, I'm so sick and tired of helping him look for things. She says, I walk into his office, and there are his glasses right in the middle of the desk. I mean, what's he doing, standing there looking with his eyes closed? And I said, hmm, probably got a male-female differences here. I said, do you have binoculars at home? Yeah, she said, I do. I said, okay, here's your assignment. I want you to go home. I want you to take his glasses, and I want you to set them down in the middle of the table. Then I want you to put the glasses up to your eyes, and I want you to find his glasses looking through the binoculars. She said, not a problem. I said, fine, call me when you find them. <laughs> so two, three hours later, I get this call, and she goes, you know, that was really more difficult than I thought it would be. She said, I said, well, did you find them? She said, yeah, but not really through the binoculars. She said, I'd have them up to my eyes. I'd move them, see the glasses, put them back in front of me, and finally I found them. I said, so that's what he's doing all the time because it's the wrong distance for him. Oh, she said, I didn't realize that. I said, so we really need to be helping each other, right? So she says, the other problem is this. He wants another child. I said, well, how many do you have? She said, three, and he wants four. I'm not having another child. And I thought, well, I hope at least one of you is fixed. <laughs> so I said, well, well what, what's the deal about not wanting another child? I don't know. He won't tell me. And I said, well, so why don't you bring him in and let's talk about it? Okay, so next week, here comes the couple. Tall, really nice-looking man, and she's grumpy. They walk into my office, and she said, well, here he is. Well, of course, he's not looking at me. He's looking out the window. And I said, remind me what the problem is. And she goes, he wants another child. Oh, I said, that's right. You have three, and you don't want another one. He still hasn't looked at me. I said to her, what's the reason that you don't want another child? Okay, my goodness, going through labor and delivery three times would be enough for me too, but we won't go there. And I said, um, what's the reason you don't want another child? Well, she says, it's so obvious. I'm thinking, not to me. I said, well, give me some particulars. Well, she said he never gets up with them when they cry at night. So I looked at him and I said, so you want another child? And she says you don't get up with them at night when they cry. I mean, can you make a couple comments about that? Not going to ask him why. He won't know why. So he's still looking out the window and he goes, well, there was four in my family and four in my folks family and I'd kind of like four children. I said, well, that's reasonable. Uh, so what's this business about not getting up with them at night? He goes, then he looks at me and he goes, I don't hear them. She goes, oh yeah, right. What's the research? 
Women respond to sounds ten times softer than anything that gets a man's attention. He goes, I don't hear them. And he says, when I do hear him, or she wakes me up and says, you know, Joey's crying, go see what he wants. He says, I don't know what the cry means. I mean, my wife knows what the cry means. I got to go and find what's going on with the kid. Blankets off, pins stuck in his leg, bored, hungry, whatever. And she knows what the cry means. He says, I'm willing to do equal work, but I, that doesn't get it for me. So she's kind of looking at me, and she goes, do you think he's telling the truth? I said, yeah, I think he is. I said, let me give you one research example. You take 43-day-old babies. You put them in the same room. You get them all crying. I don't even want to know how they got them crying. You take one of the mothers, you blindfold her, you put her in the room and say, find your baby, your newborn, by the sound of its cry, and she'll have it within three minutes. You blindfold the father. <laughs> and you put him in the room with 40 crying babies. And 40 years later, he still hasn't found his kid. So I don't know <laughs> what they decided, but I had a little chat with them about equal contribution does not mean identical things you do, because there's a huge difference. And I see this so often. You know, every school teacher ought to have all the boys sitting in the front of the room, because they don't hear as well, and every school teacher ought to have a microphone, because the boys miss a lot. You know, it'll be at the end of school, and the teacher without a microphone will go, Okay, class. You're dismissed for the week. Uh, remember, Monday we'll start with the test, the spelling test at 9 o'clock. Okay, how many of you men even heard that? <laughs> so, 9 o'clock Monday morning, the teacher says, get out your pencil and paper, we're going to have a spelling test. And all the little girls get out their pencil and paper, and the boys go, what spelling test? You didn't tell us about a spelling test. No, they didn't even hear it. And then you've got the voice inflection thing that the male brain just doesn't seem tuned into. So a uh, mother will say, you kids, it's been a rough afternoon. I'm really tired of listening to you, you know, arguing with each other. I'd be really careful what you do for the next 10 minutes if I were you. <laughs> Boys don't do anything different. They didn't hear the inflection. It's just the way it is. So we need to learn how to talk to each gender. And then we've got the problem that female speech is very indirect and male speech is very direct. So mother goes into her 10-year-old son's bedroom, and it looks like a tornado went through it. And she's visual, so next time little Farquhar comes into the kitchen, she puts her arm around him and pats him and smiles and said it'd be nice if you cleaned your room before you went out to play. What message does he get? It's optional. And his little brain goes, Sh she's smiling. She's in a good mood. What does she do when she cleans my room? Ay, 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 ay. She, you know, changes the bed and vacuums the rug and takes down the curtains. And that's a lot of work. I'm out of here. So he goes off to play. She checks his room. Nothing's changed. She finds his father. She says, your son didn't clean his room before he went out to work, to play today, do something. And the male, who's very direct, and usually whose facial expression matches the situation, they haven't taught to be nice and smile all the time, whether or not it's appropriate. He finds so far quart, and he says, son, Pick everything up off the floor before you leave the house. Is that optional? 
No. Not only is it not optional, he knows exactly what to do, pick stuff up off the floor. So he goes, picks up stuff off the floor, and then goes out to play. And his mother checks his room, and it's been cleaned up. She finds his father again. She said, I don't get no respect in this family. <laughs> how come he did it for you and not for me? Well, how come he did it for his father and not for her? Because she's speaking male speech to him or not. You speak female speech to a boy and he's not going to get it. His father spoke male speech to him and he got it. Well, she could do the same thing. She could say, pick everything up off the floor before you leave the house. No smiling, no patting his shoulder, no acting like it's no big deal, it would just be nice. No, it's very direct. And we need to become gender bilingual. We need to speak to males the way their speech style works for their brain, and to females the way it works for them. So, I never, ever want to do a seminar if males are going to be in the audience without a microphone. Because, you know, it'll be a stretch to keep you alert as it is. But without a microphone, I don't have a prayer. Because it takes you so much energy to decode the female voice compared to the male voice. That's real. So the bottom line is women process speech sounds here in Wernicke's area, doesn't matter whether it's male, female, young, or old. It matters in the male brain. He only tends to process voices in Wernicke's area where you decode speech if they're male voices. Or they're a female who's speaking loud and low. And the rest of the time, it's just right hemisphere, paying attention to the musical sound of the words, but not decoding anything. So I was talking to this lady about that, and she said, well, Harry always says he's listening to me, but if I ask him what I just said, I mean, it's something that I said two years ago. And she said, I'm, I'm going to go home and try this, because here's the deal. Of course I'm listening. Your voice is music to my ears. I just don't have a clue about what you just said. So if you're female, and you want a male to have any chance of listening to you, then there's some things you need to do. If you're a teacher, I'd be campaigning for a microphone. Lower your voice pitch and speak up anyway. Let me get out of my speaking voice. If you came to my house to visit me, my voice would be much higher pitch. The inflections would tend to go up on the end of the sentence because that's female speech. And you sound like you're asking a question even if you weren't. Which is the reason men are always telling you what to do because you sound like you're asking for help. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> so when you take public speaking courses, they find your lowest voice pitch. So my professional voice is nothing like the voice I use at home. My professional voice is several pitches lower. It's louder, and I always want a mic. And sometimes some of the men will stay awake. But otherwise, it's, you don't have a hope. And the other thing is, you keep your inflections down at the end of the sentence. Women can decode anything. But the male brain, remember, it's all about energy, how much energy it takes. Use even voice tones, so it's lower and even voice tones, because the male, mono, the male voice is very monotone. It doesn't have much pitch variation. Female voices are all over the map. And the more excited they are, the higher it goes. And he wants the bottom line. And some women say, well, I don't care what he wants. How come he can't listen? Well, it's energy. By the time you've told him the story and you get to the bottom line, 
he is so out of energy, he is not listening to you. <laughs> so you have to give him the bottom line first and trust that he will ask questions if he needs more information. So this woman says, I, well, I might try it, I'll let you know. So she calls me several days later and she said, oh my goodness. She said, we were at breakfast doing our usual thing. He's reading the paper, drinking his coffee. I'm chattering on. I said, you listen to me, Harry? He goes, yep. So she said, I took a deep breath. I lowered my voice and I said, Harry, I just bought uh, round the world tickets on the QE2, we leave Monday. <laughs> I said, and what happened? She said he spilled his coffee, dropped his paper, knocked his chair over and said, what? <laughs> so they'll hear if you give them the bottom line first. And the other thing that I noticed that I think is kind of interesting, you know, if I go out to dinner, let's say, with four or five couples, we're around a big table, and invariably, one of the wives will stand up and she'll say this. Um, I'm going to go to the restroom. Do any of you want to go with me? <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> What's it about? She's noticed something and she wants to talk to her friends about it in private. So they get up and they all troop off to the restroom and they have a conversation and then they come back to the table. Some of them never even go to the bathroom. <laughs> I have never ever yet in my whole history of life on this planet seen a man stand up in the restaurant <laughs> and say, hey guys, I'm going to the John. Who wants to go with me? Okay. Now, if you are male and you want to listen, and not every male does, this is one reason I think women need really good women friends. Because tell your story to your girlfriend and just give him the bottom line. It will really improve your marriage. He might even live longer because he's not putting out all this energy. But if you do want to listen, here's your strategies. Ask her to speak up. But keep your voice volume low while you ask her to speak up. Otherwise, you're going to sound like you're shouting at her. And many women have said, don't shout at me. And he goes, I'm not shouting at you because their volume is louder to start with. And we hear 10 times easier, if you will. Ask her to give you the bottom line first. When she starts, you know, 13 years ago I met so-and-so, say, stop, just give me the bottom line. And women avoid getting offended. They might hear it if you give it to them. You're still gonna have to pay attention because remember, it's the right side of your brain that's going to light up unless she's talking really low and loud and monotone. And you've only got about a 15% advantage on that side of the brain for decoding speech sounds. And then whatever you do, repeat what you think you heard. Because what she thought she said may have nothing to do with what you think you heard. It's the very biggest area of contention that I find when people come to talk to me. So, I was doing male-female differences the other day and somebody came up to me and said, if I, if I learn more about this, will, will that make them go away? <laughs> I don't think so. Personally, I don't want them to go away because it's the differences that add spice to life and it's so much fun. So understanding is not going to make them go away. But it is going to make a difference about your stress level in life. 
and how well you are communicating with each other. So I would really encourage you to learn all you can. Uh, probably the largest sections on my website are under brain references, gender differences, because there's so much research. And learn what you can. And when, when you're having a cross-gender conversation and things aren't going too smoothly, then stop and ask yourself, boy, is there some gender difference in speech here that I need to remember to make this conversation more effective? And above all, laugh about it, because that we're going to talk about laughter in the next section and the new research. And there's no area that I know of that is so available to trigger laughter as gender differences in male-female communication if you find the humor in it. If you don't, it's going to be really sad. I was lecturing one time at a divorce recovery group, and three of the women came up to me, tears running down their face, and said, you know, I divorced my husband for a gender difference that I didn't understand. And if I'd known this, we'd still be together. That is so sad. So learn now some of the differences and start having fun with them, because they're not going away. The person who has the difference might, however, if you can't have a collegial relationship. So, 10-minute break. We'll finish up with the brain and laughter, and you're out of here.